Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lene Palmasano, and I'm the chair of the Committee of the Whole. I'm going to call to order our regular committee meeting for Tuesday, September 6th. At this time, I'll ask the clerk to please call the roll and verify the presence of a quorum. Councilmember Payne. Present. Councilmember Wansley. Present. Councilmember Rainville. Present. Councilmember Vita. Present. Councilmember Ellison is absent. Councilmember Osman is absent. Councilmember Goodman. Present. President Jenkins. Present. Councilmember Chuktai. Present. Councilmember Koski. Present. Councilmember Johnson is absent. Vice President Chavez. Present. President Palmasano. Present. Uh, that's 10 members present. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Just a, a short correction. That was vice chair and chair. Yes. The council president is next to me. Yes. Um, I wanted Thank to you. note. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't want her getting all offended next to me. <laughs> I wanted to note that Councilmember Osman regrets missing today's meeting. He needed to leave just a few minutes ago to attend to a very urgent um, situation in his ward. Um, our thoughts are with him. So please let the record reflect that we have a quorum. We have three items on the published agenda today. In addition to our reports to committees that have met this cycle, we will begin with our public hearing, which is the consideration of the mayor's nomination of Kristen Anderson to the appointed position of city attorney for a term ending January of 2026. And so to introduce this item, we've been joined by Mayor Fry. Welcome, and I'm happy to invite him to speak on behalf of his nomination. Welcome, Mayor. Madam Vice President, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Madam President, council members, uh, honored to be here today uh, to speak on behalf of my appointment to a four-year term for city attorney in Kristen Anderson. This is one that I'm extraordinarily proud of. Uh, we got a top-notch individual uh, at a time when we most certainly need the help. Uh, her decades of experience, specifically in government law, uh, has enabled her to build an incredible reputation uh, and is known around the state as an incredible legal mind. Uh, her commitment to justice, her love for Minneapolis makes her the right person at this unique time to be city attorney. Uh, so presently, Ms. Anderson serves as general counsel, as enterprise employment law counsel, and as state ethics officer of the Minnesota Department of Management and Budget, uh, where she manages MMB's legal function, providing advice, counsel, and direction, and speaking specifically about the enterprise and employment law counsel in any major governmental entity. Uh, employment law is perhaps uh, the one that gets the most attention and the one that has the most work of, of any other. Uh, so this, this work is, is one where she essentially functions as a general, general counsel for the entire state enterprise, which is a very, very big job. Uh, and then for nearly 14 years prior to her present job, uh, Ms. Anderson worked in the office of the Minnesota Attorney General as Assistant Attorney General in the Civil Litigation Division. Uh, and in this capacity, she represented all branches of state government and the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities. And while she certainly has an incredible resume, uh, which you can see for yourself, Ms. Anderson's nomination uh, to the role of city attorney goes so far beyond the credentials that you will see on that piece of paper. Uh, she has had a steadfast commitment to just justice and a true love for the city of Minneapolis. And at the base level, she has had a commitment to quite simply make people's lives better. That is how she's lived out her career. Uh, the last several years have shown that the city will need a fighter in its corner and the skilled le legal leadership in this new cabinet that we are creating. Uh, and Ms. Anderson comes equipped uh, to lead Minneapolis forward in all capacities. Uh, I'm so grateful uh, that Ms. Anderson has taken up this extraordinary challenge to serve as our next city attorney. This is a job that ain't easy, uh, but she is most definitely up for the task. Uh, I hope that you, the City Council, uh, approve Ms. Anderson's nomination uh, and welcome her uh, to the City of Minneapolis with open arms. Uh, greatly appreciated, appreciate your uh, deliberation today, Council Members. Uh, and with that, uh, Madam Vice President, I will turn it back to you. 
Thank you, Mayor Fry. At this time, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing for the appointment of city attorney, after which I'll ask Ms. Anderson if she wants to speak um, and invite council members, my colleagues, to speak and entertain any motions to move this forward. Uh, I understand we have seven people signed up at this point in time. If there's anyone here who has not signed up but wishes to, you are welcome to see the clerk at the dais to sign up. You will each have up to two minutes, and I will ask you to state your name for the record. So the first person on um, the public hearing list is Kristen Batson, followed by Dory Leland. Again, if you can start by giving your name for the record, that would be appreciated. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Palmasano, members of the committee. My name is Kristen Batson, and I'm here to speak in support of Mayor Fry's nomination of Kristen Anderson for city attorney. I worked with Kristen at Minnesota Management and Budget, where she was general counsel, state ethics officer, and enterprise employment law counsel, and I was the deputy commissioner for enterprise employee resources. We worked together very closely as she provided advice and counsel on a wide range of personnel policies and issues. Based on this experience, I can say that Kristen is a superb choice for city attorney. Kristen has dedicated her career to good government and the public good. She has high standards for what people should be able to expect from their government and its representatives, and she embodies those standards on a daily basis. In our work together, she provided thorough and thoughtful advice and counsel on a wide range of personnel and personnel policy issues. These issues were always challenging by the time they made it to our desks, and she was a trusted advisor in her role. Her command of state and federal employment law, our robust regulatory requirements, and their intersection with our labor contracts was comprehensive and helpful to me on a daily basis. Under more exceptional circumstances, her policy advice was instrumental in keeping 36,000 state agency employees safe and productive throughout a two-year global pandemic. Kristen is clearly an excellent attorney and public servant, but she's also a great leader of people and a terrific colleague. She approaches her work with energy and enthusiasm for the positive role that government can play. She leads by example and works harder than anyone else. She conducts herself with integrity and is a role model for others. She is a positive and supportive colleague who earned the confidence and respect of leaders across state government during her tenure. Thank you for allowing me to speak in support of the nomination of Kristen Anderson for city attorney. She is a truly exceptional public servant and leader and will be an outstanding city attorney. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, next signed in here, we have Dory Leland, but it also seems that maybe you were here to speak um, not on the appointment of city attorney, but oh, on yeah. another matter. This is also related to the appointment of city attorney. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, welcome, Dory. And following Dory, we will have Tim O'Malley. Um, good afternoon, Chair, members of the council. My name is Dory Leland. Um, I've had the uh, great honor to work with Kristen um, at Minnesota Management and Budget for the last eight years. Um, as uh, the mayor indicated, Kristen has worked within and on behalf of the public sector for the last 20 years. And because of that, she really takes to heart um, that there are some heightened expectations for accountability and transparency that attach to anybody that chooses to build their career in the public sector. Accountability isn't just something that Kristen talks about, um, it's who she is and it's what she does. Um, I could give you a million examples of this, but I'll focus on just one. Um, a few years ago, we had a, um, a situation where an employee was um, terminated for sexual harassment and um, an arbitrator put the individual back to work. Um, part of the reason why they went back to work is because they found some issues with how we had done the internal investigation. Um, the case was eventually overturned by the Court of Appeals, but what I wanted to uh, focus on related to that is that Kristen took that feedback to heart, looked internally and said, you know, we do have a lot of work to improve the quality of our internal investigations. And over the past two years, um, she's made it her mission, um, one of many, to improve how we do investigations. There's now a 14-module course that covers um, the a wide array of uh, how to do internal investigations in a way that um, honors the rights of everybody who's involved in the process, but also uh, gives dignity and respect to anybody who is there. Um, it includes modules on cultural competency, on unconscious and implicit bias, and how to avoid having those things infect the decisions that you make as part of investigations. 
Um, there are so many examples that I could give you that demonstrate um, Kristen's dedication to transparency and accountability. Um, and so for entirely self-serving reasons, um, I wish I could tell you that I oppose this nomination because I'm really gonna miss working with her. Her influence is everywhere and in everything that, uh, in everything that we do. She's truly one of the most um, trusted, respected, and beloved members of state government, and I urge you to vote in favor of her nomination. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Tim O'Malley, followed by Howard Dotson. <clears throat> Welcome. My name is Tim O'Malley. I'm the Director of Ministerial Standards and Safe Environments for the Archdiocese of St. Paul in Minneapolis. I want to thank uh, Council Members Mayor for this opportunity to speak in favor of Ms. Anderson's appointment as City Attorney. I've known her for over 20 years and I've worked professionally her in a number, with her in a number of different settings. I'd like to mention three of those settings briefly. As a result of my experiences in working with her, I think I've uh, been able to develop a very informed opinion on her qualifications for this job. My career has primarily been in law and law enforcement. I served at the city, federal, and state level as a law enforcement officer, including 24 years at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. I started there as an agent and in 2010 resigned as superintendent. Kristen Anderson was at the uh, Attorney General's office during those years. We worked very closely on a number of civil matters, employment law matters, uh, a number of lawsuits, and she was uh, a tremendous assistance to us throughout that. Early in my career, I served at a private law firm, and in 2010, I returned to practicing law as the deputy chief judge at the Minnesota Office of Administrative Hearings. Again, our paths crossed for the second time. When she was at uh, MMB, I worked with her and Myron Franz quite a bit on a number of issues. Those two experiences, those two settings, I know that Ms. Anderson is smart, strategic, and practical. She's a rock-solid litigator. She knows how to use her skills judiciously for a greater good. It's one thing to prevail on the law, it's another thing to solve problems. She has an ability to, to not only use the law uh, as it should be, but also to solve those problems in the short term and to prepare for long term so that when, when, they don't, uh, when those kinds of things come up, they don't recur over and over. Lastly, I want to mention that for the last eight years, I've worked for the church. I was hired uh, as part of a comprehensive reorganization at the Catholic Church to address the horrendous sexual abuse crisis that, that came to light here a few years back. Um, I was asked to look at both short-term and long-term solutions. A key component of that was to use uh, well-talented, skilled, highly qualified lay people independent of the church. We formed a voluntary uh, advisory board Ms. Anderson said that she would serve on that board and did for the last six, seven years. Along with 10 other people, she has helped us hold wrongdoers accountable, support and care for victims and survivors of abuse, and put in place processes to, to prevent future harms. Thank you, Mr. O'Malley. I have to cut you off just to keep Thank everybody's you. time equal here. Uh, next, we'll, we'll hear from Howard Dotson and after Howard Myron Franz. Welcome. Good morning, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Howard Dotson. I know it would violate decorum, so I didn't bring cheerleader pom-poms, but if I could, I would. Ms. Anderson is what the city needs. In addition to a city manager, it's a wild, wild west out there. And there's two things I want to support you with, the opiate epidemic and the crime victims with all this gun violence that's going on. 1994, I began my journey working in healthcare. That was my first patient who died from a heroin overdose. We got so much fentanyl on our streets, as you saw from the previous report about the correlation of fentanyl and gun violence. You need to bring the feds in, the mayor, governor, call in the DEA, call in the FBI, because the cartels know Minneapolis is a wild, wild west. Those lives matter. Those parents burying their children, they matter. And I know Ms. Anderson will bring justice. The other thing I want to lift up is I've asked Mayor Garcetti of Los Angeles to call Mayor Fry. I just got back from LA, and I'm gonna be the founder and director of Twin Cities Crisis Response Team, a psychological first aid that goes out with police, fire, EMT. We have families that got the bad actors surrounding them. They're there for the camera. They're not there for the healing. And if we have CRT in place, 
will protect those crime victim families from the bad actors. And I encourage you to go YouTube a song, Will I Lose My Dignity? It's from the musical Rent. As I remember all those folks who are grieving the loss of a loved one to this opiate epidemic, play them that song and remember them too. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Myron Franz, followed by Emily Piper. Madam Vice President and Chair, Madam President, members of the com committee, <clears throat> the Mayor Fry. My name is Myron Franz. I serve as the University of Minnesota's Senior Vice President for Finance and Operations. I'm honored to present my recommendations to the Committee of the Whole today in support of Christian Anderson as City Attorney for the City of Minneapolis. I have known Ms. Anderson since 1996. We practice law together at the firm of Great Plant, Moody, Moody & Bennett, now Lathrop GPM. As you heard from Mayor Fry, Ms. Anderson joined management and budget in 2014. I was honored to have been chosen by, to lead Minnesota management and budget, first by Governor Dayton in 2015, and then again by Governor Walls in 2019. For almost six years, Ms. Anderson and I worked together at MMB, where she was a key member of the, lead, the leadership team. Her responsibilities as the mayor uh, enumerated general counsel, employment counsel, and state ethics officer. During this time, I learned the value of Ms. Anderson's leadership, her legal talents, knowledge of the law, counseling skills, sometimes to me, common sense, and her devotion and dedication to public service. As an experienced legal advisor, Ms. Anderson understands the critical and sensitive role of legal counsel in the public sector. The success we had at the state was very much due to the leadership and sound legal opinions of Ms. Anderson. She touched everything. From our efforts to ensure the state's workforce reflects the diversity of the people who live here, to introducing a new sexual harassment and prevention policy and training to improve our culture of equity and inclusion. In 2019, MMB negotiated employee pay increases with 11 different labor unions. But in, 20, in the 2020 legislative session, those pay increases were at risk after the Senate voted to approve the agreements, but with a modified version to remove the pay increases. Ms. Anderson advised us that the Senate vote to approve the, uh, voted to approve the agreements, but the additional language was not legally effective. We were able to implement those contracts. I'd just like to close by saying that uh, I recommend Ms. Anderson uh, for city attorney, and I know she spent countless hours in support of the public service, and she'll continue to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Emily Piper, followed by Sam Clark. Again, if you are here to speak on Ms. Anderson's appointment, uh, please sign in with the city clerk. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Madam President and Council Members. My name is Emily Piper, and it's my privilege to speak um, in support of Kristen Anderson's confirmation as the next Minneapolis City Attorney. I'm grateful to the Mayor and his staff um, and the City for the honor of being part of the search process uh, for the next City Attorney. I'm absolutely thrilled that Ms. Anderson's been nominated. Although I now serve as Vice President and Interim General Counsel at the Hazelden Betty Ford Foundation, in my prior roles as both General Counsel to Governor Mark Dayton and as the state's Human Services Commissioner, I worked closely with Ms. Anderson. Speaking from my personal experience as a close colleague, I'd like the Council to know a few things about Ms. Anderson. First, she's a tremendous public servant. She's dedicated her career and has brought many gifts and talents to bear in, in order to make Minnesota a better place. And I'm confident she'll do the same as city attorney. She's worked for years in government. She and I worked closely on a few key policy initiatives. Um, the first was implementing the state's first ever um, executive order on diversity, equity, and inclusion that uh, com uh, former Commissioner Franz spoke about, which helped to pave the way, reshaping everything from hiring practices to contracting in state government. The second was reforming state policies and practices on sexual harassment, and the third was on paid family leave implementation for state employees um, a few years back under Governor Mark Dayton's leadership. These efforts happened in no sp small part due to Kristen's leadership, and that's in addition to her legal work and the legal work we did together. 
And that's the uh, second thing I want to uh, highlight about Krista, and she's a brilliant public lawyer. Being a public lawyer is a really unique role representing a unit of government. It's not only challenging, but it is also for the novel and complex issues, but it's also uh, one where your advice is regular, regularly subject to public scrutiny. And sh she has handled that brilliant, brilliantly for years and has become known on a bipartisan basis as a uh, lawyer to respect. So with that, I'll close by just saying um, personally and professionally, I am just um, extraordinarily pleased and um, happy that uh, Kristen is willing to lend her gifts and talents to the city of Minneapolis. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Sam Clark. Thank you. Um, my name is Sam Clark. I was a member of the mayor's interview committee as well. Um, I'm going to do my best to finish before that beep ends. And also, uh, just to add two points that I, I haven't heard fully hit on yet, which is first, um, Kristen is someone who understands the role of a government lawyer. You can read the resume all day long, but I've had some substantive conversations with her. And, um, you know, it's my experience that you all don't want to hear no from your lawyers. You want to hear a, a yes, but, or, you know, this is how we can get where you want to get to. This is someone who's demonstrated uh, that she can do that. Um, and then secondly, uh, the only other point I'd make is uh, Kristen's someone who is committed to building relationships. She's already started that work with little old me from across the river, but, um, you know, that's building relationships with you all as policymakers. It's building relationships with her colleagues in the office, I see some of them back here, um, doing the important work of, of reforms. And it's building relationships with community, which to me might be the most important, uh, uh, it, with all due respect. But um, it's my experience that um, the community, uh, uh, justice means being there before something goes wrong. And uh, this is someone who understands that. So. Um, those are the only two points I'll make. Uh, yeah, you got a great candidate here in front of you, and uh, we made the mayor's job pretty difficult. We had a lot of great candidates, but um, he made he made the right choice. So, I'm just here in support. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this item? Anyone else that would like to speak? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and invite Kristen Anderson to address the committee. Welcome, Ms. Anderson. Thank you. Chair Palmasano, President Jenkins, members of the council, I am honored to appear before you today seeking your approval to serve as the next Minneapolis City Attorney. In true Minnesotan form, I would like to start off with some thank yous. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of the people who came here today um, to support my candid candidacy. Um, I'm trying to not get teary um, to hear all of these wonderful uh, words of support for my candidacy and for my uh, practice in the public sector. I want to thank the search committee. All of them are talented lawyers from both the public and private sectors for their commitment to the city and the time that they took to vet all of the candidates. I am so grateful to Mayor Fry for his nomination, his vote of confidence in me to fill this important role at this critical time for our city. And I want to thank you. Each and every single one of you spent the time to meet individually with me um, to just get to know who I am as a person, to listen to who, who I am and what I want to bring to this role, and to share with me your vision for what you need in the person who fills this position. And I am very, very grateful for the time that you've spent. Article 1, Section 1 of the Minnesota State Constitution provides that government is instituted for the security and benefit and protection of the people. Public service is a public trust, and I have taken that call seriously during my 22 years of legal practice at the state of Minnesota. During my 13 plus years at the Attorney General's office, I had the privilege of working on matters of public significance, 
from advising legislative leaders on the creation of the 35W Bridge Victim Compensation Fund, to litigating complex cases such as defending the constitutionality of the state law requiring transparency in campaign expenditures, to litigating to define the contours of continued government so that the most vulnerable Minnesotans still were able to receive critical government benefits during the 2011 state government shutdown. Those experiences and many others allowed me to develop my skills as a litigator, an advocate, and an advisor helping to serve the public interest. At Minnesota Management and Budget for the eight, past eight plus years as Enterprise Employment Law Council, General Counsel, and State Ethics Officer, I had the privilege to be the legal advisor to policymakers across the state enterprise. In my role, I provide advice to agencies to ensure compliance with anti-discrimination laws, laws that protect individuals with disabilities, laws that protect state employees' abilities to care for themselves and their families when they're sick. I provided legal support when the state developed its paid parental leave policy, which was a pioneer amongst employers at the time. MMB is the hub of personnel policy for the executive branch of state government. As counsel, I've been able to provide legal support for leaders as they develop programs and initiatives to create a more diverse and inclusive state workforce. My time in public service has been driven by a commitment to inclusivity and fairness. One of the projects that I'm most proud of involved working to review the state's policies and practices on preventing sexual harassment in the wake of the Me Too movement. The project involved working with stakeholders to understand how sexual harassment uniquely harms communities of color and individuals with disabilities, developing legislative proposals to increase transparency for victims of workplace harassment, which unfortunately did not pass, and developing sexual harassment prevention training for all state leaders and all state employees, incorporating feedback from engagement with victims' rights advocates. This is training which all employees must take every year. If you ever have the opportunity to take the training, you may discover that not only was I the content creator, but I was also the voice talent. As state ethics officer, I helped overhaul our code of ethics policy so it's now stronger and provides better guidance to employees about their obligation to always act with loyalty to the public interest. Annual training for leaders and employees on the policy is coming soon. And as general counsel, I've been a member of the statewide contingency response team, helping to set policies to help state government keep functioning effectively during the COVID-19 pandemic. Through all of these experiences, I have been supported to become a better lawyer and a better public servant by clients who believed wholeheartedly in the ability of government to be a force for good by mentors, role models, and managers who helped me develop and grow as a lawyer, as a leader, and as a person. This is what I want to bring as a manager of the office of the city attorney. The lawyers, paralegals, and administrative staff who serve the city in the city attorney's office are fantastic, and they are here because they love the city. For the staff of the office, I want to create a culture of empowerment an environment where they can bring their whole selves to work. I want to break down any artificial barriers to success, provide professional development and mentorship so every staff member can thrive and feel as supported as I have felt throughout my career. All of this so that each person can provide excellent service for the benefit of the people of Minneapolis. In terms of my role as lawyer, I want to bring my long experience as an employment lawyer in state government to help the city foster even more diversity, equity, and inclusion for its workforce. I want to bring my career as a zealous advocate and strategic advisor in the public sector to be a creative problem solver, to partner with you all, with Mayor Fry and the city's department heads to chart a course so that your policy vision can be lawfully enacted and executed. I want to help you to enact change to help make the lives of people who live in the city better. Many of you asked whether I felt the city attorney can represent both the executive and legislative branches in this new government structure. My answer is definitely yes. 
As a public lawyer, I know that at the end of the day, my client will be the city and the people of Minneapolis. That entails transparently providing my best legal advice and interpretation to policymakers. I have done this throughout my career in state government, even when policymakers have different perspectives from each other. The mayor, the city council members, and the department heads, you all can rely on me to follow the rules of professional responsibility and give you all my best transparent and consistent legal advice. Minneapolis is my city. I live here. I go to church here. My kids went to school here. One is still in school here. I want nothing more than to give back to this city that has given me and my family so much. I would be profoundly honored to be your next city attorney. Thank you. Thank you. Do my colleagues have any comments or questions for Ms. Anderson? I'm checking the queue and also looking for anybody's flags here. I'm not seeing any just yet. Uh, Council President Jenkins, and then Council Member Payne, and then Council Member Wansley. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Anderson, for being willing to step into this um, very, very active and important role in the city of Minneapolis. I'm, I'm curious, your last comment, you talked about the ability to be able to, to, you know, represent the city, the mayor's office, the, the council. Can you just say more about how you see that working? Uh, Chair Pomisano, President Jenkins, yes. Um, thank you for that question. I, I do understand that, that the city is going through some change in terms of, of kind of getting its, its feet wet and um, getting some organization around this new government structure. And so you now have both a, an executive branch and, and a legislative branch a little bit more um, specifically defined than, you've, than you have had in the past. Um, I have had the privilege to represent all three branches of state government. Uh, particularly at the Attorney General's office, that was part of my job to, to equally represent all three branches of government in any, any of their legal needs. And I think as a public lawyer, one of the things that we learn early on in our public service career is who is the client? The client for me right now is the state of Minnesota writ large and the people of Minnesota. Um, here, if I'm, I'm privileged enough to get this position, again, that my client would be the city, um, and all of you are acting uh, as as decision makers and policy makers, at the end of the day, the city is the client. And so there, there is um, no doubt in my mind that as a, an experienced and hopefully good <laughs> public lawyer that, that I'm, I'm very well experienced in, in managing the ability to give legal advice to, again, the different branches of government, honoring the rules of professional responsibility, knowing that really the way that I approach giving legal advice, regardless of whether it's a, a legislator or, or, or whether it's a, a department head, is to give transparent legal advice, to explain um, my legal thinking. I, I think that I have had the um, ability to uh, gain a lot of credibility at the state by being an honest actor, by being transparent, and acting with integrity so that you know that when I give you legal advice, I'm not giving different legal advice depending on who's asking me, um, that I'm giving my legal advice based on my true and, and uh, fair interpretation of, of what the law is, uh, which doesn't mean that I never change my advice. I change my advice when I learned facts that I didn't know before or when uh, someone who I'm giving legal advice to says to me, well, but Kristen, did you think about X, Y, and Z? I listen. That's one of the things that I do as a public sector lawyer is really sit down and try to listen to my client and understand what their approach is and why they think that perhaps I, I've come to a different conclusion. And if after listening to all of the facts and listening to other people's perspectives, if it causes me to change my opinion, I'll say so and I'll explain to anybody who had given a previous uh, different opinion. The reason why I changed my opinion is because I learned more information. So that's, that's my general approach. Um, I am a very collegial uh, a lawyer. I do care a lot about my clients. Um, I'll just share, share one, one thing. When, um, 
when you leave a job, people tend to come reach out to you and say nice things about you. Um, and, and one HR leader um, said something to me in the last week that, that really, I think, kind of speaks to this. And that was, you know, Kristen, I appreciate your legal advice, not only because I think your answers are legally sound, but also because of your approach. You try to understand uh, and empathize and understand the big picture of where your client is coming from. And that's what I would bring um, to you all and trying to give my best legal advice to, again, the council, to the mayor, to the department heads. You can, you can count on me to, to give, again, that transparent and um, honest legal advice uh, as, as issues come up. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Anderson. And I guess just a follow-up, uh, Mr. Clark stated that you take a creative approach to trying to get to yes. Is there an example that you may be able to share with us that exemplifies that? Uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, President Jenkins, um, without... Uh, invading the attorney-client privilege. I'm not sure I can give you a specific example, but I can, again, talk to you about, about my approach. Uh, it's not uncommon for a policymaker to want to do X. And, and sometimes we find that, um, uh, that folks have decided that X is the right course without necessarily knowing what the, what the options are. There have been circumstances where the X that the policymaker wanted to get, get to was not completely legally sound. Um, so my approach in that circumstance is to, number one, explain. Um, I don't know if you, you, you heard that I do a lot of training in my job, and so a piece of me is kind of the natural teacher. Um, so, so part of my approach to that is explain to the policymaker why it is that X is not the right course. But I have been a public sector lawyer for an awfully long time, and I think that that has given me the ability to have a lot of tools in my creative tool toolbox, so that instead of saying, okay, maybe we can't get to X, but we could get to Y, which is right next to X, and we can do it in this manner, in this manner, in this manner, and give options to my clients so that they can get as close to X as they possibly can in as legally sound a manner as possible. In my experience, there are situations where, um, where we can set things up as we, as we develop policy so that things are the most defensible that we possibly can have them be. And together, again, with the policymakers, we, we tweak policy, we, we make the policy as enforceable as possible, and then we enforce. And if we're challenged in court, um, we are in a position to be able to defend, and I defend those, those claims very, very vigorously. Um, as my, as a, a, a longtime litigator, I do have the ability to see, uh, as I'm advising, how things might go wrong, um, and again, adjust the policy making so that we avoid those issues so that if we are ever challenged, um, that we've got a fantastic defense, and, and I, I have a, a history of zealously representing the state um, to ensure that, that our policies are upheld. Thank you. Councilmember Payne. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Ms. Anderson. You've actually spoken to one of my key concerns, which is around how you're going to approach this kind of transition period and then hopefully a more mature version of uh, our new structure of government. And I think you speaking to always having the people as your client as kind of your focus is a really strong way of navigating some of that complexity, which gets to another one of my concerns, which is, uh, you know, one of the most sensitive legal issues that we're facing right now is uh, not just our response to the findings from the Minnesota Department of Human Rights, but also the ongoing investigation by the Department of Justice into uh, patterns and practices within our police department. And I think in serving the people, I want to make sure that uh, as we're looking at some of our outside counsel, um, one, of, one of the areas I've been very concerned about is our representation by Jones Day as a law firm. Um, 
your interests are with the pay people. I'm not entirely sure which interests Jones Days are aligned with. Um, you know, reading reporting about some of their longtime relationship to the Federalist Society, a, a multi-decade effort to flip the Supreme Court, which they've successfully been able to do, which overturned Roe v. Wade. They, they think in long term, and they have a very seemingly big picture scope of what they're trying to transform the world into. That frankly frightens me. And so I don't know that Jones Day has our interests in mind in the way that you have our interests in mind. And so I'm curious as to how you'll approach these types of relationships with outside counsel that maybe don't have that kind of grounding in serving the people. Chair Pomasano, Council Member Payne, um, thank, you, thank you for that question. Um, obviously not being part of the city yet, I can't speak to uh, exactly what role Jones Day is playing, um, you know, what their representation has been like. You know, I know that they're a large national law firm um, and, and do have some areas of, of expertise. What, what I can talk to you about is my approach. Okay, um, so I, what I can talk to you about is my pro, uh, approach. Um, you're right, as a public lawyer, I do know who my client is. Um, I promise you I will never abdicate that responsibility, and I never have. I have a lot of experience at Minnesota Management and Budget working with you know, what I'd call outside counsel, sort of being the in-house counsel to outside counsel. I am very active. Um, I don't let... Uh, someone go forth with a strategy that I think is is inappropriate for my client. Um, I think that any of my clients probably in the room can tell you that I'm no shrinking violet, um, that I understand who my client is. I work really hard to understand what is in the best interest of my client, um, and I, I don't ab abdicate that responsibility. Um, in this role, I would be a, a very you know, one of my priorities, obviously, um, would be to jump in and really dig into um, the negotiations with MDHR and the, the DOJ investigation. Um, and I, I plan to lead that effort. I do need help, absolutely. And there are, um, there is expertise that Jones Day has that I don't have. But again, as a public lawyer for the last 22 years and as a lawyer overall for 26 years, it's hard to put pull the wool over my eyes. You know, I, I, I understand when I'm getting good legal advice and when I'm not getting good legal advice and I have no problems um, making sure that as, as kind of my approach with you all is to explain my rationale, I, I would require the same thing for, for any of the lawyers working for me, whether it's from Jones Day or within the city attorney's office itself. Thank you. Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Pomisano. Um, I just have three questions, but I'll start with a comment. Um, so I do want to note the city attorney has an incredibly important role to play um, in the city on enterprise and making sure that we're actively combating policies and practices that allow Minneapolis to be one of the worst cities in the nation as it relates to racial inequities. And while I've been on you know, council for a short period of time now, nine months, it's been frustrating to see what I believe are some systemic um, problematic behaviors with the city attorney's office as it relates to police. Um, as council member Payne you know, related, some of these uh, problematic behaviors have even been documented in the Minnesota Department of Human Rights findings that also found that the city attorney's office has played a role in enabling, enabling you know, the racist and violent practices that have existed within MPD, at least over the course of their 10-year analysis. Um, so much so, and as a result of that, this council has voted on many lawsuits related to police misconduct, and taxpayers have had to foot the bill for these legal settlements. Um, and that said, I have a major concern about the ability of the city attorney's office to provide assistance and support and mitigation. Many of my constituents have, uh, and, and I agree with them, and I agree with this myself, of, of 
feeling that many of these lawsuits could have been prevented. And I want to see a city attorney who has the ability to look at what's happening within the city, identify high risk behaviors, and provide advice on mechanisms that need to be in place in order for taxpayers to not have to continue to pay for the mistakes of MPD. So that said, the first question is, how do you plan to improve the mitigation practices of the city attorney's office as it relates to lawsuits against MPD? Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Mem Member Wansley, thank you for that question. Um, since I'm not at the city, I can't speak to what mitigation practices are happening right now, but again, uh, similar to how I answered Council Member Payne's uh, question, I can tell you about my approach. Um, as an employment lawyer, um, the idea of accountability, and frankly, a state ethics officer, the idea of accountability and, and holding public servants accountable has always been at the forefront of, of my legal practice um, at the state. Um, one of the things that we've, we've done a lot at the state is really try to insert legal services uh, along the road you know, my, my intent is to always support good officers, but for the folks who are, are not following the rules, accountability is key and frankly a huge measure of prevention. So one of the things that I've done at the state is um, you know, just like here, the, we have a unionized workforce and a unionized um, work environment that has due process requirements. And so one of the things that I've done is really try to imbue legal services along the chain so that um, investigations are as comprehensive and provide as much due process as possible, and Ms. Leland talked about that a little bit. Um, working uh, to make sure that we've got legal advice for decision makers so that they're making good decisions about discipline that is really based on findings of just cause. And then really working again with decision makers to make sure that discipline letters, again, give notice, um, satisfy due process so that once we get to the point of actually making a discipline decision, a discharge decision, and wind up at arbitration, that we've got the best possible case that we can and can prevail. Um, and really imbuing legal services in that arbitration process to make sure that we're handling, handling them as the pieces of litigation that they are. Um, when we can hold bad actors accountable, I think that speaks volumes to, to the folks that, that, that are there. Um, that accountability piece, again, is something that I've spent a lot of time at the state um, trying to, to shore up and, and something that I would want to look at the processes and, and to the extent that, that I've got ideas of how to shore up those processes of accountability, I, I absolutely, absolutely want to do that. Thank you. Um, second question. So it's been also clear that we need um, standardized policies within the city to identify uh, officers, as you named some of the bad actors, those who engage in high-risk behaviors and intervene before that behavior reaches a point of a lawsuit, um, which also around arbitration, arbitration process, like that's too late for a person to be, um, you know, so many things should have been addressed before going to that. Um, Will you commit to collaborating on establishing then internal policies with MPD, the Human Resource Department, and other relevant city leadership in this process around, you know, shoring up um, that, that checks and balances? It seems like you're framing that around, like, legal services. Um, is that commitment extended to these specific departments here at the city? Uh, Chair Palmasano, uh, Councilman Member Wansley, of course, all of the departments will be, be my client, and again, you know, approach-wise, um, as Enterprise Employment Law Council, this is this is exactly the sort of stuff that I've been working on at MMB for for the statewide enterprise, making sure that, frankly, supervisors and managers are well trained on uh, on how to do discipline and discharge, um, how you know how the the managers and supervisors can have the support that they need to make sure that they are observing due process just cause, but that they know what the tools are in their toolbox and that they feel empowered to use them and providing that you know, real-time real legal advice. A lot of what I've done at the state is training, but also a lot of what I've done at the state is giving real-time legal advice to managers and supervisors when they've got a problem and making sure that they've got that legal support so that they know what the next steps are, how to do it in as strong of a way as possible so that, again, at the end of the day, any, any discipline that's actually taken is, is upheld. 
Thank you. And last question. So during our one-to-one, -one, I know that I was going to give you some homework on this one about braiding materials. Um, I would love to hear your vision or your plan to strengthen the city's handling of braiding materials as a way to better the transparency around, you know, problematic officers, especially, you know, better that transparency with the public. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Wansley, um, thank you for that question and you did give me a little bit of a homework assignment. Um, so again, unfortunately, not being part of the city, I'm not privy to all of the things that the city are, is doing with respect to Brady and Giglio. Um, I, I understand that the city attorney's office is working on enhancing its Brady database so it's, it's more robust and searchable. Um, one of the things that, that you know, I think I talked about with many of you is that I'm a very relational person. Um, relationships both with my clients, and I think Sandy Clark talked about it, relationships with the community. Um, a, a big piece of that is also relationships with other jurisdictions. And I know that, um, that the city attorney's office and that kind of the, all of the Brady disclosures, uh, a lot of that hinges on the relationship between the city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County. And so um, I, I was fortunate enough that I was actually in the mall with my daughter and I got a call um, from Mike Freeman who's already offered to, to sit down and, and build that relationship and, and there are two fantastic candidates for Hennepin County Attorney. Um, I want to, uh, if I'm lucky enough to get this appointment in very, very short order to, to meet with all three of them and, and talk with them about, about their perspectives um, and really strengthen that relationship um, amongst amongst our jurisdictions and, and, and frankly, as Sammy sort of pointed out, also reaching across the river uh, and talking with our, our colleagues um, in, in all the surrounding metro areas about how, how do you do this? How do we, how do we learn from each other and, and do all of this better? Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Chavez. And I don't see anybody else in queue, um, but we'll ask if there's anybody else after. Chair Palmasano. And thank you for being here. I know Councilmember Payne mentioned our work with Jones Day, which was touching part of my first question, which was in regards to your opinion about contracting with outside legal counsel, especially when we have talented city staff here in the city of Minneapolis that can do the same work. I know that you're not here yet, but some of the concerns I specifically have with Jones Day is that uh, at the beginning of the consent decree process, they were questioning the facts and they broke a lot of trust in our communities by adding to the delay of the negotiations. So if you can just continue to elaborate on like your approach to outside legal counsel work, especially like I mentioned earlier, when we have talented staff here in the city of Minneapolis that can do the same work. Uh, Chair Palmasano, Council Member Chavez, um, I am at a disadvantage not knowing, you know, frankly, the, the um, backgrounds and experiences of the, of the folks in the city attorney's office. Um, if we need assistance from outside counsel, then we'll, we'll need to have, have that assistance. But I do want to get in, you know, one of my priorities, I got a lot of priorities and, and I, it's going to be really busy <laughs> if I get appointed. But one of my priorities is to sit down uh, with the folks in our office and, and really get to know them and get to know what their experiences are, you know, what, what skills um, and, and backgrounds they have to bring to bear. Um, just from a sort of a, a, a taxpayer steward, um, if we've got the, the resources within the office, um, th then that would certainly be my preference. But I also want to be realistic that some of the things that, that we're dealing with, particularly with the Department of Justice, is, is nuanced stuff, and it may be that there are not folks in the office that, that have that experience. Um, again, as I, I answered, Council Member Payne, um, I will absolutely make sure that whatever external legal services that, that the city uh, receives are, are in the best interest of the city. I will not abdicate that role. Thank you. And then my last question. I represent a big undocumented community here in the Ninth Ward. And across the city of Minneapolis, we have a lot of undocumented immigrants that hide in the shadows. I guess one of my questions and a little background in regards to that Specific charges can add to the deportation of a lot of undocumented people here in Minneapolis. Would you support implementing a process to consider immigration uh, consequences within the charging decisions in the city attorney's office? Uh, 
Chair Pomisano, Council Member Chavez, and we talked about this a little bit in our in our one on one meeting. Um, I am very well aware um, that that the stakes are much much higher for our undocumented um, residents, and I'm very very sensitive to that fact. I know that the City Attorney's Office has a, a, a really interesting diversion program. Um, if I'm uh, actually hired for this position, I really want to dig into that and see if there are ways that we can strengthen that diversion. Um, you know, folks shouldn't, shouldn't be in a position of, of um, ruining the rest of their lives, frankly, because of um, decisions made out of, out of youth or, or, or that's, that sort of thing, particularly nonviolent crime. So I really want to look into the diversion programs um, as really a way of, of doing that sort of community rebuilding. Um, that's the most effective thing when, when folks who, who violate community standards can, can um, make amends and, and within the community um, and have the ability to, to you know, make a life for themselves without having um, criminal uh, background that, that, that really hangs over their neck and, and you know, either leads to potential deportation or um, inability to get job and housing and all of those things. And if there's a way that we can address that through the diversion program, um, I, I think it's a really creative solution to a really big problem. Thank you. Council Member Chugtai. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm really excited that, that you're here today and I, I really appreciate all of the different folks um, who've worked with you over the course of your career coming in and telling us a little bit about their relationship to you. Um, in the time that I spent with you, I really see the way in which you prioritize relationship building and, and that's something that's really important to me as well and I'm thrilled to, to see someone in this role um, who wants to prioritize that. Um, and then I think uh, Council Member Payne mentioned this earlier, but I um, was really moved by, by hearing you say um, that, you know, you're always looking out for, for the people and they are ultimately um, the, the clients that you want to, to protect um, and, and serve. So I want to talk about two um, different pieces. The first, um, this is a, this is a, a case, I think, going back to November of, of 2020. So shortly after uh, the presidential election in 2020, um, uh, there was a group of 646, so nearly 700 people, um, that walked onto the I-94 highway. Um, and, you know, there wasn't anyone um, stopping these people from, from entering the highway as we previously have seen in, in cases like this. Um, and so, you know, a group of people walked onto uh, I-94 um, and then were blocked from, from leaving that highway. Subsequently, this group of people was held on the highway for um, upwards of six hours. And this was something that, uh, like, the state... Um, was highly involved in, along with like Hennepin County sheriffs and, and the Minneapolis Police Department. So there was multiple law enforcement bodies um, that are involved. Um, and then, you know, all of these these people, um, I was in, I, you know, transparently, I was one of the people that was on that highway that day and, and ended up um, being uh, arrested that day. Um, in the past, right, uh, there have been other similar cases where, where people were arrested, activists have been arrested for, for um, going onto a highway. Um, but what's previously been different is that there's, you know, we see um, dispersal orders given. We see people have the opportunity to leave the highway if they want to. Um, usually anyone who's arrested is, you know, cited and released. And then... Um, Following that, lots of most of the time, these charges end up getting dropped, with the exception of a handful. Um, but in this specific instance, what was unprecedented was that there was no dispersal order given. Anybody who wanted to leave the highway was not allowed to to leave and was held there for a number of hours. Um, and then most of these these people were prosecuted. Um, I know you weren't here for for this case at all. Uh, but we know that our, our former city attorney, you know, told um, a handful of prominent activists in the Twin Cities that 
the city of Minneapolis chose to, to prosecute these individuals as a result of a lot of political pressure from, from the governor's office um, and um, from the public safety commissioner at the, at the state. And so, um, you know, I think I want to know a little bit more about uh, whether you would be open to dropping the charges for, for these individuals. And then broadly, I want to know what your vision is for honoring um, people's First Amendment rights uh, to protest and, and, you know, not having criminal records attached to people for, for doing, um, for, for, you know, participating in activities like this. Uh, Chair Pomisano, Council Member Chug Tai, um, without knowing more about the situations and the, the individual situations, I, I can't commit to you one way or the other about you know what I would or will do in terms of those charges. I'm certainly happy to take a look at that if I'm appointed. Um, generally speaking, from a uh, you know my my commitment to the First Amendment. Again, as a public sector lawyer, I have a great and strong commitment to the First Amendment. I do understand that sometimes we have really difficult situations where we have to balance people's First Amendment rights on one hand, and on the other hand, safety and a really, really dangerous situation and how you prevent that sort of dangerous situation from happening in the future. Um, again, I can't really speak to what I would have done. I don't want to armchair quarterback <laughs> anybody. I don't think that that's fair. Um, but kind of back to the relationship piece, you know, one of the things that I said this over and over again, I really am a relationship person. Um, I, I do aim to, um, Sammy Clark gave me actually amazingly good advice. <laughs> um, and that was early, get out and talk to community leaders and not just in Minneapolis, because we are no longer just, you know, an island to ourselves but also get out and talk to community leaders in St. Paul and in the Twin Cities metro area. That's something that I really, really want to do. So we establish a relationship. You know, it to me it goes a long way when when problems arise when you've actually had the ability to to know each other a little bit and know and establish uh, that you are credible and that you're somebody who can be trusted. So that when things are difficult. Um, we come at it knowing that, that there is a, an honorable actor on the other side. So um, I really want to get out into the community um, and would love your assistance um, in, in your wards um, to have those introductions with the community leaders so that we can really start building a, a, a relationship. That's really wonderful. Thank you. Um, and then the second piece I want to talk about is um, the, the way in which uh, we support, um, we, the city, um, and the city attorney's office supports survivors of violence, whether it's gun violence, sexual violence, um, and, and, and other forms. Um, I was, you know, I, I know that um, one of the folks who came uh, to testify on your behalf earlier talked a lot about um, a specific case that, that you um, handled around um, a sexual harassment case and, you know, that person getting their job back through arbitration um, and what that taught you. I, was, I really appreciate that. Um, I want to know a little bit more about how we want to, as a city, prioritize prosecuting perpetrators of these forms of violence um, and how we treat survivors who we're working with in, in these cases with care and dignity and respect. And specifically, I want to call your attention to um, this multi-part uh, Star Tribune piece that was written, I think, mostly in 2018. Um, and it talked about the way in which survivors of sexual violence are, are treated throughout the process of reporting, um, whether it's by uh, police departments, and there were multiple instances of, of um, cases with the Minneapolis Police Department that were referenced, as were, um, at, you know, and other law enforcement bodies were included in this as well. Um, but how, um, how people are treated throughout investigation and then the way that these uh, cases, when they're prosecuted, um, are, are handled. Um, and mostly, you know, the devastating part of this piece was, you know, a bunch of, of people, residents of Minneapolis, um, walking away from a really traumatic experience that happened to them um, with more trauma at the hands of people who were really supposed to intervene and get some justice for, for them. 
Um, so I want to know a little bit more about the type of culture you want to see built in the city of Minneapolis on how we support survivors of all forms of violence. Chair Palmasano, uh, Council Member Chugtai, uh, thank you for that question. Um, again, can't comment on, on what the city, city does. I, I do think that just looking at my own history and the, the work that I've spent a lot of time on is sexual harassment prevention. And obviously it doesn't come in the, in the context of, of crime, it really comes in the context of, of workplace harassment. But I think a lot of the learnings that, that I've had in that process really could lend itself to, to um, working on this issue when it comes to crime victim survivors. You know, one of the, the most enlightening things that, that, I, that I did in the whole sexual harassment prevention policy review was getting that um, feedback from communities of color and communities who represent um, individuals with disabilities and really understanding that um, sexual violence, whether it be in the form of, of workplace harassment or, or in the terms of, of crime, really can have an especial um, negative consequence to, to different people in different communities and their, their sort of their voice and their ability to, to stand up and, and advocate for themselves. So that's, that's something that, that I learned about and really have a deep and fundamental appreciation for. Um, in, in terms of what the city can do um, to sh kind of shore up again, I don't know what, what the city is doing, um, but, but I do think a, a piece of this is really, really good training um, so that folks who are interacting with, with victim survivors understand trauma, trauma-enforced response, um, understand cultural uh, mechanisms that, that may make um, certain folks more vulnerable to, to harassment, to violence. Um, I think that kind of training is really an invaluable thing um, to really, to, you know, I, I don't think anybody's coming at it from, from being a, a bad actor. It's just sometimes out of just not knowing. And I think that that, you know, the ability to train folks and really get the aha moment, kind of like I had in, in, in my work, um, is really, really important. And once you sort of understand um, what trauma looks like and, and what the vulnerabilities are um, to be able to have some like good training to understand that and then how to navigate that. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Council Member Goodman. Um, thank you, Madam Vice President. I'm wondering if the public hearing is closed. It is. We've closed the public hearing. Uh, thank you. Then I'd like to make a motion to approve Kristen Anderson as the mayor's choice for council approval to serve as the next count city attorney. And I'd like to speak to that motion, if I may. Sure. First, may we have a second? Second. second. There you go. Uh, go ahead, Council Member Goodman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the council. The job of city attorney, in my personal opinion, is one of the most important roles that the city can have. You. Kristen Anderson and the 20 or 30 people who have served before you over the history of the city of Minneapolis are individuals who have served in a position that has been created by the original charter of the city. It has always been a position approved by the mayor and the city council, and that's why we're here today. Every department head is an important part of the large puzzle that is the city enterprise, but the city attorney is truly unique in that there are multiple hats that have to be worn. You are going to be the attorney for the enterprise. That consists of multiple departments, probably 22 or so different departments with hundreds of different business lines and over 4,000 employees. As a result of being the attorney for the city, you will make decisions and uh, drive a staff team that serves boards, commissions, and independent organizations and agencies that oversees contracts in various departments and otherwise keeps all of our employees, as many of my colleagues have said, out of legal trouble. So in addition to being probably the largest public law firm in the state of Minnesota, maybe except for the Attorney General's office. Uh, we are so privileged to have some incredible people who work in our city attorney's office. I uh, hate to point people out, but I'm going to point out Mary Ellen Hang, 
who we are so lucky to have as the head of our criminal division who has done incredible work with your team over many years and we appreciate you, Mary Ellen, and what your work has been incredible. And Eric Nilsson, my dear friend of many years, who started out handling quasi-judicial members and the zone, uh, issues in the zoning and planning committee, worked his way up through the civil division and leads a team of incredible people who do our civil work. You're walking into a department that has very good managers, many of them in the room today, and an ongoing culture of respect and pride in being public lawyers. So what kinds of things should we think about when determining who the city attorney should be? To me, it's not really about how you um, have acted in your previous roles, but the relationships you build and how you approach the work. And I've heard that said by Councilmember Chugtai. I've heard that said today by Councilmember Wansley, and as well as the others who have spoken. But really, this is a job that requires an exceptional public lawyer. And many people have come today, and others have made calls and comments to let us know what an incredible public lawyer you are. When I look at you, I think you're so young. Yet you have this incredible experience for someone who's been out of law school for 22 years. You have been committed to the rule of law and to the Constitution and the oath that you took when you became a lawyer. Uh, you are highly regarded by the people you have worked with and against in government as well as in other places. I often wonder if we'll be able to hire these incredible top talent leaders in the country and in the state, and you standing here today have proved to me that the city is resilient, that we have the ability to attract incredible talent. We have it in the office now. And the addition of you, Kristen Anderson, as the next city attorney, one of only less than 50 people have ever had this job in the history of the city makes me really proud. I'm really proud to be able to have had an opportunity to get to know you. I think you will um, fall in the footsteps of Jay Heffern and Susan Siegel and Peter Ginder and the others who have done this incredible job. I am proud to be able to move this motion today and urge my colleagues to vote yes for Kristen Anderson because her commitment to public law cannot be questioned. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair Palmisano. I don't know how I got in after you. That was, that was amazing. Like, I should have just took my name out the queue. <laughs> ah, man. <No. laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Anderson. I know we were um, just able to meet briefly, but what I will say is everything I felt during the time you sat in my office, your former colleagues or current colleagues have just said today. So thank you for being authentic and thank you for really, you know, um, speaking to what we need to hear and not what we want to hear today. I really appreciate that. I told you in my office that even when it's hard for me to take, I want a city attorney who tells me the truth, who tells me to back down, who tells me that's not going to work. And you assured me that that is who you are. And I believe you, you know, that that means a great deal to me. I believe you. Our city needs that right now. Like we need to know what's right and what's wrong, what can be done and what can't be done. Most of all, I just want to say thank you for your passion for Minneapolis. When I asked you the question why you wanted this job, you said exactly what I say to people when I ran for city council. Most of the time people say it to you in a dreadful way, right? Like, why do you want this job? And those of us who love service, we're excited to tell people why we want this job, right? It's our city. It's the place we love. We want to see Minneapolis at its best. And so thank you. Thank you for being passionate about it. Thank you for being just a geeky, nerdy lawyer who <laughs> loves lawyering. You know, like it would, you could tell in 10 seconds that this is your jam. And I love that. I love smart, brilliant people who are passionate about about their gift of service. They, they offered their gifts of service, right? Like, I can't be you, but you are a great you. And thank you so much. I'm excited for you to come to the city. I look forward to working with you. Uh, some of the attorneys I spoke with is looking forward to you bringing your long years of experience 
uh, to the city. Some, some, you have some tools that haven't been here previously. And some of the attorneys I spoke with are really looking forward to you doing that work. So thank you so very much. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion and nobody, oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Rainville. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Anderson, thank you so much for stepping up to serve our community. And I just want you to know that while you'll be second guessed and you'll be criticized, your, you and your staff will all be supported. So thank you for, thank you. for helping heal our city and, and help us rebound. Thank you. Great, now seeing no further discussion, um, the motion to grant consent to Mayor Fry's nomination of Kristen Anderson as city attorney is before us and I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Council Member Payne. Aye. Council Member Wansley. Aye. Council Member Rainville. Aye. Council Member Vita. Aye. Council Member Goodman. Aye. President Jenkins. Aye. Councilmember Chuktai. Aye. Councilmember Koski. Aye. Vice Chair Chavez. Aye. Chair Palmasano. Aye. That's 10 yeas and zero nays. Thank you. That carries. Welcome to Minneapolis, the city of Minneapolis, as city of our city of Toronto. Now, colleagues, we'll move back to our consent agenda. Those that have come just for this particular <laughs> item are welcome to go ahead and, and convene out in the hall um, and offer their congratulations. Item number two is a resolution calling on retail brands to support climate advocates by reducing maritime shipping emissions. And item number three is an update to the appointment of council members to various boards, commissions, and committees by adding an appointment to the Minneapolis Tree Advisory Commission. Is there any discussion on the consent portion of today's agenda, or are there any items anyone would like to pull off for further discussion? I'm not seeing any. So I'll move approval of items two and three. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. That carries, and that item is approved. Next, we'll receive reports from our standing committees on matters to be considered by the full council this Thursday. We'll begin with our business inspections, housing and zoning committee chaired by council member Goodman. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The biz committee is bringing forward 14 actions for approval on Thursday. Item number one is our CAPER, or Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report. Item two is the North Star East Inclusionary Zoning TIF Plan. Item three is an interim use permit for Simpson Housing Services. And I do want to just comment, um, for those of you who were not in committee, I, I would say that Council Member Chugtai and I almost started crying. Uh, because the conversation between the neighbors who had a concern and the applicant who was here was amongst the most loving, kind, and peaceful conversation I have ever seen in all of my years chairing a meeting. It was just really heartwarming, and it says we've really turned the corner on how we speak to each other about very complicated issues. And congratulations to Councilmember Chugtai for having this in her ward and being passionate about it. It was very moving. And I think if you, any of you who aren't on the committee want to ask us about it, it was really a, an amazing moment. Item number three was an interim use permit uh, that is being withdrawn. Item four is opting, uh, adopting the findings for the nuisance condition process review panel to raise 4704 17th Avenue South. Item six are the liquor license approvals and seven are the renewals. Eight are grants from DEED um, as well as the county's environments, environmental response fund for projects in Minneapolis. Item nine are some comp plan amendments with regard to the built form guidance. Item 10 is a comp plan amendment with regard to the built form guidance. Item 11 is uh, just a change as it pertains to the Minneapolis Advisory Committee on Housing. Item 12 is the Heritage Preservation Commission appointment of Barbara Howard 
Um, item 13 is an agreement with MnDOT long coming for a public art railing on Olson Bridge. And item 14 is uh, an application for WADAG Commons. Uh, this is asking the HUD for some funding. Uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions on any of those items. Thank you. Not seeing any. Next, we have our Policy and Government Oversight Committee. It was chaired this morning by Council Member Wansley. Thank you, Chair Palmasano. Um, the Policy and Government Oversight Committee is bringing forward 17 items that it is recommending for approval. Uh, the first is a appointed position in the proposed Office of City Auditor. Um, the second is a bid for the Minneapolis Convention Center ceiling and lighting upgrade project. The third is a contract with MapLight for a campaign finance system. Number four is a contract with Turnham Partners, Inc. for crisis communication consultant and services. Number five is customization of contract form with Gallagher and Benefit Services, Inc. for classification and compensation consultant services. Number six is a contract amendment from NRG Energy Center, Minneapolis, LLC, to clear away Energy, LLC, for steam supply to heat the public service center in the community service building. Number seven is a contract amendment with Modern Piping Inc. for mechanical work for the public service building. Eight is a contract amendment with Advanced Systems Integration LLC for additional audio visual system services for the public service uh, building. Number nine is a contract amendment with Acoustics Associates Inc. for additional flooring work for the public service building. Number 10 is a contract amendment with Egan Company for Fridley Campus Electrical Construction. Number 11 is a contract amendment with Connick Inc. for the support and maintenance of the city's election uh, management system. Number 12 is a contract amendment with Northside Economic Opportunity Network, also known as NEON, for a work, uh, workspace at 1006 West Broadway Ave. 13 is a lease amendment with HBC Acquisitions LLC for additional election space. Number 14 is a legal settlement um, with Justice Feldman versus the city of Minneapolis, Muhammad Hama. Uh, number 15 is a gift acceptance from the Minneapolis Downtown Council for the mayoral work group's reception. And then um, I do want to note the last two, uh, 16 and 17, those will not be showing on council because they're receiving foul, but number 16 is a 2022 quarterly financial status report on select city funds. And then number 17 is a surveillance ordinance um, updates um, from our staff. Um, and with that, I will stand for questions or discussion. I'm not seeing any. Oh, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I at least wanted to speak on the receive and file items number 17. Um, I want to note that we did have a public hearing on the UAV or drone uh, usage program um, by MPD and PHS about two weeks ago. And that public hearing uh, showed that there's a deep level of concern amongst our community about the usage of these drones. Um, I do want to note, you know, since the mayor is the sole authority over MPD, council cannot delay or limit MPD's use of drones. And they've also have already decided to do um, the implementation of this in are within legal statute to do so. But that being said, the council does have authority in moving forward a standardized surveillance policy that will provide many of the safety mechanisms um, that hopefully are in alignment with what the community asked for um, at that public hammering and over the past couple years. Um, all that said, actually today um, in policy and government oversight, um, our committee meeting, we took the initiative to request an update from staff on the status of uh, overarching surveillance uh, framework that they are development with the leadership of Council Vice uh, Pre President Palmasano and Council President, sorry, Council Member Payne. Who has been a long day? Um, that meeting allowed for further discussion, and I'm really pleased to say that I'm working with both uh, council members on a staff direction to bring forward this Thursday um, to initiate the process of hopefully moving an uh, ordinance forward and giving some thoughts of what those parameters can look like in, in consultation with our staff. So I look forward to you know continuing engaging the public and my colleagues on this important issue and super excited to you know hopefully have an ordinance that can be considered soon. So I just wanted to note that for the public record. Thank you. Um, 
Next, we have the Public Health and Safety Committee. That committee is chaired by Council Member Vita. Thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Health and Safety Committee is bringing forward five items that it's recommending for approval. Item one is approving an appointment to the Public Health Advisory Committee. Item two is authorizing a joint powers agreement with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for air monitoring equipment. Item three is accepting an additional grant from the Minnesota Department of Health for the Safer Sex Intervention Project. Item four is accepting a grant from the National Association of County and City Officials for Emergency Preparedness for Homelessness Hygiene. And item five is amending a resolution to update the funding of revenue code. I'll stand for any questions on these items. Thank you. Councilmember Vita has provided updates from Public Health and Safety Committee, not seeing any questions or comments, I'll move to Public Works and Infrastructure Committee. I believe that report will be given by its Vice Chair, Councilmember Koski. Yes, thank you, Madam Vice President. The Public Works and Infrastructure Committee will be bringing seven items um, for recommending for approval this Thursday. The first is approving the appointment of Kevin Dillon to the Bicycle Advisory Committee. The second is amending the seat number for an appointment to the Pedestrian Advisory Committee. Number three is authorizing a cooperative agreement with MnDOT for the reconstruction of the intersection of I-394 at Washington Avenue North. Number four is authorizing an agreement with the Hennepin County for uh, Bryant Avenue South Street reconstruction project. Number five is authorizing a contract with Canadian Pacific for a railroad crossing upgrade as part of the Upper Harbor Terminal Public Infrastructure Project. Number six is adopting a report designating the 2023 non-governmental tax-exempt parcel streetlight operation fee assessment. And number seven is adopting a report designating the 2023 non-governmental tax-exempt parcel street maintenance assessment. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Not seeing any. So with that, we've concluded all business to come before committee today. And hearing no objection, I will... <laughs> and maybe some knocking from <laughs> somewhere. Um, I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>